In previous lectures, I talked about how there are different settings of the sodium and potassium channels, how they can be like open, closed, closed and ready, closed and not ready. So this lecture, I'll cover those and then we'll go through a few other things about action potentials. So the first thing we're looking at are the voltage gated potassium channels. And this is a protein that lies within the cell membrane. You can see the outside is here, cell interior here, and it's within the membrane. This voltage-gated potassium channel opens and closes in response to changes in electricity. So a local potential will cause it to open or close. When the voltage-gated potassium channel opens, the only thing that fits through it is potassium ions. It is specific to potassium ions. The cool thing about this channel is that it has only two conformations. So it is either open and closed. That's it. It either opens or closes. The thing about the potassium channel is it is slow to close. So this causes that hyperpolarization. So if you remember, we had our little graph here. It looked something like this. This is the action potential graph, right? During depolarization here, this is where the potassium channel proteins are um, open, and then they're trying to close, but they're too slow. Once it reaches that regular um, resting membrane potential at negative 70, it should close, but they're really slow to close, so the cell ends up being hyperpolarized. So the reason cells get hyperpolarized is because of this slow-moving potassium channel. Sodium channels are slightly different. Um, they have three possible states. So they can either be closed and ready to open, which you can see in number one here and number four here. They can be open, so they're completely open, they're specific for sodium, so the only thing that can exchange is sodium. Or they can be in a state called closed and not able to open. So in this closed and not able to open here, you see this little ball? It's inactivating the sodium channel. So in the closed and unable to open state, nothing could cause the sodium channel to open. So closed. Closed and inactivated, nothing can allow the sodium channel to reopen. It needs some time to reset. With these group think questions, again, I suggest that you go through these on your own and then scroll down to check your answers to see if they are correct. Hopefully you were able to get these answers. So depolarization, remember that's the upward spike that we see. Sodium rushing into the cell causes depolarization. Potassium rushing out causes repolarization. And then potassium going out of the cell in excess causes hyperpolarization because the potassium channels are slow to close, which leads to hyperpolarization. Um, the type of channels, these are voltage-gated channels that open and close and changes to electricity. And Potassium ions move after sodium ions because the potassium gate is slow. It is very slow to open and close, and the sodium gate is really fast. So the goal of action potentials is to travel along the cell membrane to trigger something else to happen. So while they spread across the membrane, we call this propagation, and there are two different ways that action potentials can propagate. There's contiguous conduction and saltatory conduction. First, contiguous conduction is a little bit slower. The action potential spreads along every bit of membrane. So this touches every single part of the membrane. It's spread by local current flow, 
just like the graded potentials that you guys saw and it slowly moves across the whole way. Saltatory connection is from the Latin term saltare, which means to jump. So this goes back to the little nodes of Ron VA that we talked about and the myelin sheath. So here is the axon of the neuron. And then these little bubbles are little sections that are myelinated. Remember, these are the Schwann cells or the oligodendrocytes, depending on if it's peripheral or central nervous system. Here, the action potentials are able to jump from one node to the next, to the next, to the next. This ends up being much faster. So action potentials jump. Because there is myelination, the action potentials are able to skip this whole part of the membrane. So they only have to touch a much smaller part of the membrane in order to propagate the action potential. This is looking at a cross section of the same thing we saw previously. You can see the axon is here, and then there are little myelinated regions. At the nodes of Ron VA, there are um, lots and lots of voltage-gated sodium channels. So in the myelinated regions, there are very few, but in the nodes of Ron VA, there are a bunch. So this allows for really fast diffusion of sodium, and then it can um, propagate down the membrane here. This group think is asking, the diffusion of sodium ions is saltatory conduction is fast. However, sodium ions diffuse in contiguous conduction as well. So the question is, why is saltatory conduction faster than contiguous if they're both using the same mechanism? Pause, take a second to think about it, and then we'll scroll down for the answer. So the thing about saltatory conduction versus contiguous is that the nodes, there are lots and lots of ions because there are lots and lots of sodium channels. So this allows them to um, switch through the membrane much quicker than through contigu contiguous conductions. Something else to talk about is a thing called a refractory period. So this is the time when another action potential either cannot be generated or is harder to generate. So this is the time in between action potentials. We cannot constantly be having action potentials. There needs to be some amount of space in between them. We call this refractory periods. There are two different types. I highly recommend knowing both. So absolute refractory period is this portion here. Um, in this like lighter yellow color. During this time, it is absolutely impossible to fire a new action potential, and this is maintaining the one-way flow, so action potentials aren't oscillating throughout the membrane. In the relative refractory period, it's possible that an action potential could fire, but it is much harder, so this limits the frequency and I'll explain that in a second a little bit better. So with absolute refractory periods, nothing can initiate another action potential, no matter how strong it is, no matter anything. This is because those sodium voltage gated channels are closed and they are unable to open. So when they are unable to open, there's nothing that can happen that would allow them to open. They just need to have that time below threshold to reset so that the protein is ready to open. So during an absolute refractory period, it is absolutely possible to have another action potential. In the relative refractory period, it's possible to fire another action potential, but there needs to be a stronger than normal stimulus. So. This is because the potassium channels are still open and the cell is hyperpolarized. So in a hyperpolarized state, the cell is more negative. So it is harder to get the cell to meet that threshold. Remember the threshold was somewhere around like negative 55 sometimes. So normally when it's resting at negative 70, to get to negative 55 is pretty quick. That's a little bit easier. But when the cell is hyperpolarized at negative 90, to get to negative 
55, that's another 20 extra millivolts that the cell needs to be depolarized to in order to meet the threshold to cause a full action potential. So something that is kind of hard to think about is how our brain actually codes this information. So, okay, so there's action potential spreading along the membrane. They tell a neuron to release neurotransmitter. What does that actually mean? Like, why is that happening? And this allows our brain to code the information that we get. So our brain codes information in two ways. There's qualitative information and quantitative information. Qualitative information is saying what it is. So this might be it's painful, this was a touch, I heard something, I see something. And depending on which neurons are fired, that will tell you which type of information you have. Quantitative information shows how intense something is. So if you get told, oh, it's a pain from the type of neurons, then the qualitative neurons will tell you how intense it is. And they do this by having more action potentials. So there's a shorter time between action potentials. So if we look at this green graph on the bottom, there are two lines. The top one has action potentials firing occasionally. The bottom one has lots and lots of action potentials firing very, very frequently. So based on this, we know that the bottom graph is showing a stronger stimulus because there are more rapid firings of action potentials. There are several group think slides coming up here. I highly recommend pausing, answering them, and then going to the questions. But for that, I will leave you guys to do these group thinks on your own, and then I'll resume the next lecture just after that.